you're destined to win. We gotta turn it around. Hi, I'm Pastor Frank Santora, and I wanna welcome you to Destined to Win. Have you ever tried to break a bad habit or start a new one with no success at all? Well, what if I told you that you don't need stronger willpower, you just need to literally change your mind. Every thought, every action, every reaction we have creates ruts in the brain, and it creates a track that we unconsciously follow, whether we intend to or not. I hope you'll join me today as I share with you how you can retrain your mind in our series, Mental Health Goals. As the blood of those who lost their lives cries out to our lost world, many times we look for answers, answers to questions like why and how and what do we do to prevent these things from happening again? And, and when we ask these questions, a lot of times we ask the questions and, and, and we don't necessarily have answers. We want, we want other people to have the answers. We want other people to come up with the solutions, but, but we don't necessarily know what they are, and, 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 and at least from a, from a worldly point of view. But, but I believe that the first murder in history perhaps offers some answers. And it's noteworthy to mention that when Cain killed Abel, there were no weapons, and I, and I don't say that to weigh in on the great gun debate because, again, I can leave all those political discussions for the world to have, but I say that because I believe there is a deeper issue that is at stake for what is happening in our world and sometimes on a mass scale and all too often, and God himself gives us the answer to this question of why and how and, and, and what do we do to stop it in this story because in Genesis chapter number four, look at the Lord's words, verse number six. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And, 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 and what, why has your countenance fallen? And sometimes we ask, why are people disturbed? And, and why are people seem like they are distressed to a point where they have, where they have no mental capacity anymore or they are mentally deranged? And, and notice what God goes on to say. He says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, and it, but you shall rule over it. In other words, there's a path past sin. But, but if you don't get take that path past sin, sin is going to rule over you. And, and so what God is basically telling us is the answer to these tragic events that seemingly uh, gets overlooked and overshadowed by the tragic events, the, the answer to what is behind the why that is often masked behind the murders and, and, is, and the senseless killing and the hate that stays sneakingly in the shadows behind the suffering so it doesn't draw attention to itself because it doesn't want to be outed is this thing called sin. Sin is not cute. It, it, it's not harmless. It's not small. It is severe, and it is surely the reason for suffering. Sadly, we have sanitized sin in our world. We have called it missing the mark. We have explained it away by misusing and abusing the grace of God. We have made people feel comfortable practicing it. We have stripped it out of our preaching. We have decided that to talk about it would be to offend people, and God forbid we tell people that practicing this or that is wrong. And perhaps the reason why we've done all this is because none of us has mastered it. Yet all of us would find greater strength to overcome it if we had the courage to bring it out of the shadows. Yet still, and perhaps because of the weakness of our humanity and the ploy of the enemy, we have even gone so far as to redefine what is right and wrong, what is sin, so as to appease everyone, fulfilling the prophetic utterance of Isaiah chapter 5, verse number 20, when Isaiah said this, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Perhaps Isaiah was speaking of a woe uh, that we have just experienced again, the bitter consequences of sin when it is sanitized, when it is made easy, when it is redefined for the mass masses, such horrifying consequences as the two horrific evils that we saw replaying themselves in our world over and over again. What is sin? What is it? Sin is rebelling against God's standard. That's what Cain did. Cain did not want to bring God a first fruits offering. 
he decided that he was going to set the standard, even though God had made the standard clear, he was going to set it, and it was God's job to acquiesce to the standard that Cain set. That, my friends, is sin. Sin is when we decide that we get to set the standard, that we, we thumb our noses in the face of God and in arrogance and in pride, we pull a Frank Sinatra and we say, God, we're going to do it our way. And there's a little bit of Cain in each of us. Well, God, I think that that's too much. And, and, and well, I'm not really ready for that kind of commitment. Or, God, everyone else is doing it. It is culturally acceptable, and therefore so should I. Or worse yet, too bad, God. There are Christians, Christians, who literally will say, too bad, God, I'm not doing that. I'm not going with that. That is sin. It is saying, God, your standard is incorrect. Your standard is inachievable. Your standard is unfair. Your standard is unholy. Your standard goes against my likes. It goes against my dislikes. So I'm doing what I want anyway. Or to be able to ultimately be free of God's standard, there are a host of other, of other people who despite the mountain of evidence in favor of the existence of God choose to not believe in him so they don't have to hold themselves accountable to that standard. Sin. It's the reason. It's the reason for everything that we see. It's rebelling against God's standard. It is setting that standard of right and wrong ourselves and saying, God, acquiesce. And in order to do this, we have to override our conscience, which God has created on the inside of us so that we would even know right and wrong. This created consciousness of what is right and wrong is literally at work in the hearts of every person that is born. Sure, it comes alive even more, and I'll explain that in just a minute. It doesn't necessarily come alive, but there is a desire that goes with it when you become born again to want to please God. But there is this right and wrong acknowledgement on the inside. Romans chapter 2, verse number 14 says, When outsiders who have never heard of God's law follow it more or less by instinct, they confirm its truth by their obedience. They show that God's law is not something alien imposed on us from without, but woven into the very fabric of our creation. There is something deep within that echoes God's yes and no, God's right and wrong. We instinctively, by virtue of creation, know right from wrong. Something on the inside tells us, oh, that's not right, or oh, that, that's okay. We feel it, and oftentimes what happens when we sin, I know this because I've practiced sin, like you, we sear our conscience to the point where we become comfortable with the sin, and then we ask ourselves, why, 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 why? Sin is the answer to the why question. But secondly, evil is the consequence. Again, notice the words of God to Cain and Cain's actions. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And by the way, what's amazing about people when they sin, and, and even it, it, if they're not ready to come to repentance, instead of dealing with the sin, what they do is they get mad at everybody else. I've just seen this at work. Even in the lives of, of people who you would think would never be. No matter how loving, no matter how restorative you are, when people don't want to just confess, when they don't just say, I need help in this area, what they do is they start shooting at everybody else, blaming and deflecting the issue, which is sin. If you do well, will you not be accepted? God will say, listen, don't, don't, don't put an attitude on. Don't, don't, don't act like somebody did something to you. The reason for this is sin. If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you. In other words, sin doesn't want to just take a little bit. Sin wants to take all of it. Sin wants to rule your life and ruin your life. The old saying, sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, cost you more than you're willing to pay. Sin lies at the door, and it shall rule over you. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother. Now who knows what that conversation was like? Maybe that conversation was Abel saying, well, Cain, you know, you know this. You know you can't just bring God any old offering. You know you can't just give God a tip. You know God, you can't just give God your leftovers. You know ever since the beginning of time, and by the way, this is before the law, law all of you people who are looking for an excuse not to do what God says this is an area of your life, right? Ever since the beginning of time, God always said, bring the first fruits. 
You know this, Cain. And maybe Cain could not handle the truth. And so because he could not handle the truth, maybe they begin to war and to fight with one another. And Cain rose up against his brother, and he killed him. When Cain chose to sin, to rebel against God's standard, the consequence was he did evil. Why? Because, listen to me, sin contaminates the heart. Sure, it contaminates some more outward, in more outwardly warped ways than others, but nevertheless, it contaminates the heart. And when the heart of man becomes contaminated, the consequences are wicked and evil. The sin of Adam and Eve rebelling against God's standard of not eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why? Because they said, oh, that's not fair. They said, well, we ought to have them all. God, we don't think you. By the way, whenever God tells you not to do something, God is not holding out on you. God is not trying to raid on you, run on our parade. God is trying to protect us. So they disobeyed. They rebelled against God's standard. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. By the way, we don't know whether it was an apple or not. The Bible never says apple. I saw a thing on Facebook, you know, it was trying to, in favor of guns, not in favor of guns, the wars that are going on on Facebook. And one, one person said, well, you know, uh, Cain rose up and killed Abel with a rock. God didn't remove all the rocks. No, he, it doesn't say he, he hit him with a rock. It's not in the Bible. So you just roll up and see what people do is they try to twist the word of God always. That's why we keep the political discussions outside the church, right? Because those don't get us anywhere. We get to the truth of what the word of God has to say in the situation, right? And so Adam and Eve, they rebel against God's standard by eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then it passes down. Who's it passed down to? It passes down to Cain. And Cain rises up and he kills his brother Abel, he does evil because sin contaminates the heart, right? And by the time we get all the way to Noah's generation, look at what sin has done to the heart. Genesis chapter 6, verse number 5. Then the Lord, the Lord saw the wickedness of man that it was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. By the way, just aside, you, you know why... God destroyed the earth by flood, right? The reason why is because fornication corrupted the entire seed of humanity. The sons of God and the daughters of men intermarried, creating half-breeds of people. The only ones that remained righteous or untouched by it were Noah and his family. God was actually waiting as long as he could. With God is always long-suffering and withholding judgment. God is never quick to judge. And so God had to rescue the human race. Otherwise, the human race would have been extinct. And it happened through fornication. Fornication is nothing to play with, my friends. What do we think is happening in our world right now? The increase of fornication is the devil's playbook just going over and over and over again. And by the time we come to the book of Genesis, to the generation of Noah, man's heart is entirely wicked because of the sin. Evil is the consequence of sin which rots the heart of man. Jeremiah put it this way, Jeremiah 17, verse number 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And then, of course, Jesus himself says, from within, out of the heart of man, proceeds evil, thoughts, adulterers, fornications, murders. By the way, just because it's so prevalent in our society, fornication is not sex. We all understand, sex is clean. Sex is holy. Sex is God-ordained. Sex is one man, one woman in the confines of marriage. That's fine. Fornication is anything outside of that. Anything. Doesn't matter if you think, you know, well, this is normal, this isn't normal. Anything outside of that. And notice what it says. Out of the evilness in a man's heart proceed all these. Murderers. Comes out of evil. Why? Because sin contaminates the heart. Thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. What must be done to stop the evils that continually rear their ugly heads over and over again in the world? Yes, we must use wisdom, and yes, we must pray for our leaders so that they can legislate laws that check the evilness of a man's heart and make the consequences severe enough that man pauses before man acts. Yes, 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 we need that. But heart change cannot be legislated. It has to be intrinsically motivated. It has to come from within. How? 
Is your life going in the direction that you want it to? For your career, for your finances, and for your relationships? Did you know that the thoughts you think influence your direction more than anything else? That is why your mind is being targeted by the enemy. Pastor Frank Santora sounds the alarm in an effort to help you stay woke to the strategies the enemy uses to keep you from renewing your mind. Using recent discoveries in epigenetics and solid biblical teaching, he reveals how you can change the course of your life by changing your mind in his latest ebook, Stay Woke, The Keto Diet for Your Mind. In it, he will show you where your spiritual diet may have gone off track and show you how to feed your mind the right diet in order to enjoy spiritual fitness. Just visit www.franksantora.cc to download your free copy today and prepare to be changed. This is not a diet book, rather a guide to total life change by getting your thinking on track. This is the last point. It's going to take me a little bit, but this is where I want to stay, right? Jesus is the answer. Just like Isaiah prophesied about the days we are living in when he said right will be called wrong and wrong will be called right, another prophet foretold the promise to counteract the evil in man's heart. Ezekiel 36 verse 26 says, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will take away the heart of stone, the heart is re that is re resistant to the standard of God, and I will put in you a heart of flesh and give you a heart of flesh, one that is pliable and open to the standard of God. The promise is then reiterated in the book of Hebrews as the writer discuss discusses the difference between the legislative covenant of the Old Testament and the sovereignly sealed yet individually selected covenant of the New Testament. Meaning the Old Testament was God's law given to expose man's heart, but the New Testament was God's covenant given to change man's heart. Did you get that? The old covenant was God's covenant given to expose man's heart. The new covenant was given to change man's heart. The former was upheld from without, imposed through legislation. The latter is upheld from within. How? Because God has given us a new heart. Listen to the reiteration of Ezekiel's prophetic promise. Hebrews chapter 8 verse number 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind, watch this, and write them in their hearts. Intrinsic motivation. And I will be their God, and they will be my people. Simply put, this new covenant will change man's heart from within instead of to trying to legislate it from without. The new covenant will deal with man's problem, sin, and consequently change man's evil within. How? By giving God, man, a heart that is sensitive to God's standards. It is dangerous when we as a Christian are not sensitive to God's standard. I'm not saying perfect. This is not be the first one to admit every once in a hundred years I sin. That was a joke. Come on, lighten up. Whenever you talk about sin, people just, right? Not perfect, but it's dangerous when, when our heart is not at least sensitive to the standard of God, where, where, where it's just, just easy, right? That's a dangerous place for us to be. This heart of flesh is what God wants to give us, a sensitive heart instead of a heart of stone. What is the heart change called? It's called being born again. Listen to what the scripture says. Jesus famously had a conversation with a man who was a legislator of the law. Nicodemus, he was a Pharisee. What was he trying to do? He was trying to get man to change by legislating legal rules for them to follow over and over and over again. And so Jesus has this conversation with him. He asked Jesus, he says, what must I do to, to, to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again. By the way, I love the illustration. God is so smart, right? Imagine you have to get your heart replaced, right? What happens when your heart comes out? They keep you alive on machines, right? Technically, you're dead. And then, boom, they put a new heart in you, and boom, you start pumping again. I'm just having fun. But your body has to accept that, right? In the same way, what happens is, is when, when we're born again, God puts his spirit on the inside of us. We become sensitive to the standards of God. But now our flesh has to accept that. 
And there's this war that then goes on in our body, right? Warring against our heart, warring to accept the standard, warring to, and we've got to feed that heart. We've got to feed that spirit so that it becomes strong enough so that the rest of us accepts the standard of God. Who are we to say, God, your standard is not the one that we are living by? He says, unless a man be born again, cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, most assuredly, it, most assuredly means it's possible. I say to you, unless one is born of water, natural birth, and of the spirit, spiritual rebirth, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. To be born again, we have to repent of our sins. Watch this. And submit to God's standard. When you become born again, what you're doing is you're saying, God, I bow my knee to your lordship. What does that mean when you bow your knee to the lordship of Jesus Christ? It's saying, I not only repent of my sins, I turn from them, but now I submit to your standard. You are the Lord. You get to call the shot. You get to make the rules. And my heart is now okay with that because I now have a heart that is sensitive to your standards. We forgot what it means to be born again. We think what it means is that we're going to heaven, but we still get to call the shots. That's fake born again. That's not real born again. When you become born again, you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, understanding he's the one who paid the price for your sins and my sins, and then you receive the Holy Spirit to live on the inside of you so that your heart can be changed and you no longer have a propensity to do evil, but now you have a desire and a willingness to want to please the Lord. Therefore, when one becomes born again, one's heart is filled with a love for God and the love of God, and therefore the lives of the very people he created and died for, whether they are black, white, white, red, brown, old, rich, young, whatever, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because the love of God is shed abroad in your heart, you now want to please God and love your fellow man. How do we deal with the evil in the world? Yeah, we can legislate, and yeah, we can make it tough, and yeah, we can do all those kind of things, and that will curb it, right? But that's not going to stop it. Because man's heart is evil. Jesus is the answer. 1 Peter 2.24. He who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we having died to sins might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. When we become born again, we have a desire to live by God's right standards. We acquiesce. We submit. We surrender to the standard of God. How, how dare we? How dare we say, God, no, no. Who are we? For God, we are the created thing. For God, that we have our life, our breath, our being because of him. We forgot every air we breathe in. It's because God is bringing, breathing out. In him we live and move and have our being. We forgot how dependent and thank God for his mercy and his grace. Otherwise, we'd all be dead. His righteousness. The answer is Jesus. The answer is Jesus. Only he can change the heart. Only he can heal the hate. Only he can restore the mind. Only he can make us whole. Only he can give us the inner strength to strive to live by God's holy standard. Only Jesus can help us to see what is truly right and wrong. Only Jesus can help us to overcome the madness. Jesus is the answer. So your mind matters more than you thought, right? In order to change your life, you have to change your mind, but can only be accomplished when you use God's mighty weapons. If you'd like some additional encouragement, I've not only prepared some audio lessons, but a practical study guide as well to aid you in your journey to accomplishing your mental health goals. Check this out. Your mind matters more than you think. If you have ever tried to break bad habits, tried to establish better relationships, or tried to follow through on resolutions without success, then there is good news for you. It's not a matter of increasing your willpower, it's a matter of changing your mind. In his Mental Health Goals Volume 1 Study Guide set, Pastor Frank Santora explores the mighty weapons God has given us to eliminate bad habits and repeal the cycles that keep defeating us. This first volume not only includes three powerful digital audio lessons on a USB drive, but also a companion study guide booklet with fill-in notes and prompts for your personal study. 
This first volume is available alone for your gift of $20 to the ministry. But if you would like to take the next step to replace the old habits and thoughts with new ones, Volume 2 introduces the mighty renewing weapons in four additional lessons that reinforce that what you see in your mind and say with your mouth, you will do with your life. For your gift of $40 to the ministry, you will receive both Volumes 1 and 2 for a total of seven digital lessons and two companion study guide booklets to help you achieve your mental health goals. Just visit franksantora.cc to order today. Focusing on our mental health is not a new idea. God has already laid out how we can deal with these struggles right in His Word. So be encouraged. You do have the ability to change your mind and rewire your brain to form beneficial habits, but only when you rely on God's wisdom and strength. And that's all possible because with Jesus, you're destined to win. Spirit of God, have your way. Sweep across this room and move in miraculous ways. Manifest your glory, Spirit. This room and move in miraculous ways. Manifest your glory now. Manifest your glory now. Cause where you If you're in the New York City or Connecticut area, we invite you to visit us at one of our locations or join us online every Sunday at faithchurch.cc live. On behalf of Pastor Frank and from all of us at Faith Church, God bless you, we love you, and we'll see you next week.